and welcome to our next video looking at Scotland's long reformation and some of the key figures in it. Now the last time we left off Charles I had surrendered to the Scottish Covenanter army um, and they had handed him over to the English Parliament. So by the end of 1647 the king's a prisoner of the English Parliament at a place called Carisbrook Castle which is on the Isle of Wight and whilst he's there we have an event known as the Engagement. In an attempt to drive a wedge between the Scots and the English Parliament, Charles I secretly meets with some of the Scottish commissioners. Um, and in this engagement, he said that he would try Presbyterianism in England for three years uh, if the Scottish commissioners agreed to, to raise an army in support of the King. Now, whilst the Scottish Parliament agreed with this engagement, the leading covenanters and, and the church in Scotland didn't, and they openly opposed it um, from the pulpits. So this made getting an army um, together more difficult for the, for the Scottish Parliament. Um, but when they did, um, the, the army that they got just wasn't sufficient and were easily defeated by the English Parliament uh, Parliamentarian Army at the Battle of Preston in August 1648. After this, the stricter Covenanters gained control in Scotland and in January 1649, they passed the Act of Classes, which removes all these engagers from, from military and public office. Meanwhile, down in England, the King is put on trial for treason and on the 30th of January 1649, he's beheaded. Now, this news isn't received well in Scotland because although the Covenanters had opposed Charles I, they didn't support his execution. Um, and almost immediately, the Scottish Parliament declared his son, Charles II, as King. And negotiations between Charles II and the Scottish Commissioners begin in Breda, in the Netherlands. Uh, this is where the King's been living uh, in exile. The Scots Assembly and the Parliament, they lay down strict conditions on, on Charles II, and he's made to sign the National Covenant and the Solemn Legal Covenant, which he does. Sadly, later on, we'll see just the King's insincerity in doing this, but anyway, he signs it and um, in June 1650 lands in Scotland. Almost immediately on hearing this news, the English army launched a preemptive strike against the Scots. And despite Cromwell appealing to the Scots that Charles II is not a fit king for, for such a godly people, we have the Battle of Dunbar and it's a complete defeat for the Scots. Now, after this, we have a, a split in the Covenanter ranks um, because as a way of dealing with this invasion, the Scottish Parliament relaxes its view on, on, on these engagers, those who had engaged with Charles I um, um, and who had been excluded by the act of classes from, from uh, positions in the military and public office. It relaxes its view of them and then draw up public resolutions to let them back into the army to fight for Charles II. Those who accept these resolutions are known as resolutioners. Those who oppose them are known as protesters. And some of the, the, the leaders of these protesters were, were men like the Reverend Patrick Glesby, who is Minister of the High Church in Glasgow. You've got the, the famous Reverend Samuel Rutherford, author of Lex Rex and Minister um, from Anmouth, uh, one of the Scottish Commissioners to the Westminster Assembly, who is now at this time Professor of Divinity in St Andrews. And we've got the lawyer of the National Covenant, Archibald Johnson of Warriston. But one of the most outspoken of, of, of these protester leaders was the Reverend James Guthrie, who openly preached against them um, from the pulpit. James Guthrie had originally been minister at Lauder in the borders, in the borders but he was now the minister in Stirling, where his steadfastness and uncompromising nature earned him the nickname Sickerfoot, meaning sure-footed. An example of his nature can be found when a friend wanted him to compromise on a certain matter. And he said to him, Mr Guthrie, we have an old Scots proverb. Duke that the wave might gang o'er ye. Well, you need duke a wee bit. To which Guthrie replied, there is nae duking in the cause of Christ. Duke is to duck, so there's no ducking in the cause of Christ. Anyway, because he spoke out against these resolutions, Guthrie summoned to come before the king at Perth. Charles II is hoping to get Guthrie to toe the line, but it would end up being the king that would be put in his place because Guthrie argued so well against the king's authority 
um, with regards to, to matters in the church and the king's authority in the church. So the king didn't proceed any further and in January 1651, again after reaffirming his commitment to the covenants, Charles II is crowned at Schoon near Perth. The crown being placed on his head by Archibald Campbell, the Marquis of Argyll, and we'll hear more about him uh, in the next video. After this, more royalists gain control of the military and the parliament in Scotland and they get rid of, of those act of classes which had excluded the, the, the engagers. Meanwhile, James Guthrie, he's still trying to steer God, uh, Scotland on a, a more godly path and this time he's speaking out about Cromwell um, and his approach to religion in, in one of his sermons. The two of them meet in Glasgow where after a debate Cromwell called him the little man who could not bow. Again, just showing Guthrie's uncompromising nature in, um, with regards to, to matters of religion. Now, with Cromwell still in Scotland, Charles II and a Scots Royalist army bypass him and invade England, hoping to gather support from Royalists in England um, and make it to London uh, to reclaim the, the, the crown. However, he doesn't get any support in England and Cromwell is pursuing after him. And the two sides meet at the Battle of Worcester in September 1651, which is to be the last battle of the English Civil War. And it's a complete victory for Cromwell and his army. And the, and the Scots Royalist Army is completely defeated. Charles II escapes and after a few close calls, manages to make it over to France. And that leaves Oliver Cromwell now ruling over Scotland, England and Ireland as, as Lord Protector. So what was it like um, in, in the beginning of the 1650s? Well, Scotland's in a bit of a mess, and, and the Covenanters, they're split into two groups. The Resolutioners, supporters of Charles II, who are blaming the state of the nation on a lack of unity. And you've got the protesters, those stricter Covenanters, who are saying that, that the country's in this mess because, as a nation, we, we're not seeking Christ in all matters. James Guthrie said that it was the, the ignorance of so many people that are taking the Covenants that was the, the cause of God's wrath on Scotland. He specifically attacked the, the Scottish ministers who he said were allowing anybody to, to take the, the covenants um, without actually educating them as to what they were and the, the seriousness of attaching your, your names to them. In fact, he goes on to write a pamphlet called The Causes of the Lord's Wrath Against Scotland in which he lists a, a whole series of issues with the nation and the church in Scotland. The protesters, they also refuse to accept the authority of the General Assembly, which is being led by, by mainly by resolutioners. And in July 1653, both sides actually hold separate General Assemblies in St Giles in Edinburgh, with a partition separating them. However, Cromwell's military governor in Scotland, he dissolves them, as there's some suspicion that they're in contact with some Highland Royalists who were having an uprising in the north, which is known as the Glen Caring Rising. Now, there would be no more General Assemblies in Scotland for, for 37 years. But in Scotland, um, what was it like for the Covenanters uh, during Cromwell's time? Well, he supported the protesters over the resolutioners, and although neither side, protester or resolutioner, uh, recognised his authority. And although there was no General Assembly allowed, um, there was peace and freedom to preach the gospel. And it was a time when many were converted in Scotland. In fact, one Presbyterian said that he believed that there were more souls converted to Christ in that short period of time than in any season since the Reformation. And he goes on to say that every parish had a minister, every village had a school, every family almost had a Bible. Yes, in, in, in most of the country, all of the children could read the scriptures and were provided with Bibles either by their parents or by their ministers. Now, Oliver Cromwell dies in 1658, leaving his son, Richard, in control. However, Richard, he doesn't have the same ability to rule as his father does, and in 1660, the exiled Charles II is asked to return and declared king. Now, he's welcomed into London with great festivities. Um, this is known as the Restoration, the Restoration of the Monarchy. Even in Edinburgh, there's a great party. However, in Scotland, Charles II has old scores to settle, and almost right away, he begins to hunt down the Covenanter leaders. One of the first that Charles has executed is James Guthrie. 
Now, there's many charges against Guthrie, but it was his pamphlet, The Causes of the Lord's Wrath Against Scotland, that was one of the, the main ones. And it was also a personal grudge being held by, by a man called John Middleton, um, who was a King's Commissioner in Scotland. Guthrie had, had excommunicated him several years earlier, so there was a, a grudge being held by Middleton. James Guthrie goes to the gallows on the 1st of June 1661, and his last words before he died were, The covenants, the covenants shall yet be Scotland's reviving. After he was, he was killed, his head was taken and placed on a spike above the city gates um, of Edinburgh as a warning to others. And it would stay there for the next 28 years, during which Scotland's covenanters would suffer terrible persecution. And that's where we'll pick it up from in the next video. We'll look at the restoration of Charles II and we'll look at the restoration martyrs. We'll look at the beginning of the persecution and we'll see how the Covenanters resisted uh, Charles II. So thanks again for watching. Uh, we'll bring the next video to you, to you shortly. And um, thanks again. Take care. Bye.